This is a video on postmenopausal bleeding in secondary care. My name is Dr Johnson and I'm a gynaecologist from Southampton. The definition of postmenopausal bleeding is bleeding in women more than 12 months since their last menstrual period. In women on hormone replacement therapy, any unscheduled breakthrough bleeding is defined as PMB. Heavy withdrawal bleeding can also be abnormal. Elderly patients sometimes describe abnormal bleeding as a period, so beware. Common causes of postmenopausal bleeding are lower genital tract atrophy, lack of oestrogen, some vulval conditions, skin conditions, scratching, vulval cancer, vaginal causes, atrophy, polyp, cancer, cervical causes, atrophy, polyp, cancer, endometrial causes, polyp, hematometra, pyometra, endometrial cancer, adnexal causes, tubal or ovarian cancer, or commonly late ovarian activity, bowel cancer, bladder, urinary tract infection or cancer. In all women with postmenopausal bleeding, the overall risk of malignancy is around 10%. In the group of women with postmenopausal bleeding who are on HRT, their risk of cancer is 1%. In women on tamoxifen, the risk of endometrial cancer is increased, so any bleeding warrants referral for endometrial biopsy. The risk factors for endometrial carcinoma are obesity, diabetes, nulliparity, functioning ovarian tumours, medication, tamoxifen, unopposed oestrogen-only HRT in women with a uterus, and a family history of breast cancer, ovarian cancer or colon cancer, as well as previous pelvic irradiation. Management of postmenopausal bleeding in secondary care is to take a careful history, do a pelvic ultrasound, a speculum examination in all patients, and if indicated, a colposcopy, a hysteroscopy if indicated by ultrasound using the SIGN guidelines, and possibly a biopsy from the cervix and or the endometrium. The kind of questions we ask women who present with postmenopausal bleeding are, when did you bleed? Did anything bring it on, like coughing, constipation or intercourse? How heavy was the bleeding? Did you have any pain, and if so, where was your pain? Did you have sore breasts? In women under 60, this suggests late ovarian activity. Are you on HRT? And if so, which one? Have you missed any HRT or changed the brand? Have you had vomiting or diarrhea, which suggests malabsorption of HRT? And are you up to date with your smear tests? Are you on tamoxifen? Tamoxifen is an oestrogen antagonist with some oestrogen agonist action as well. It's for the treatment or prevention of oestrogen receptor positive breast cancer, but it causes an increased incidence of endometrial polyps. Also a six-fold increase in endometrial cancer. Screening for endometrial abnormalities in asymptomatic women on tamoxifen is not useful but you should measure the endometrial thickness if you're performing a pelvic scan, but be careful on how you interpret your findings. Asymptomatically postmenopausal thickened endometrium of more than 5 mm should be referred to gynaecology. Typical appearance of women on tamoxifen is subendometrial cystic change, but this can be indistinguishable from intracavitary change. So if there's any bleeding in a woman on tamoxifen, she needs an endometrial biopsy, irrespective of the ultrasound findings. The ultrasound of the pelvis must be done transvaginally. You may also need to do a transabdominal scan if the ovary is not visible transvaginally if it's high. We then use the SIGN guidelines, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network guideline, to triage for the need of hysteroscopy. It's potential that you can diagnose endometrial cancer, cervical cancer and other pelvic malignancies like ovary, bladder and bowel cancer. The Scottish Intercollegiate Guideline Network wrote a guideline to triage women with postmenopausal bleeding for the need for hysteroscopy. 
If the endometrial thickness is below the threshold, the risk of endometrial cancer is less than 1%. And in that setting, hysteroscopy is not necessary unless symptoms recur. And using this guideline, at least a third of women, if not more, do not need a hysteroscopy. If people are not on HRT, the normal cutoff is 3 mm. If they're on continuous combined HRT, the cutoff is still 3 mm. But if they're on cyclical HRT, the cutoff is 5 mm, and this allows for the thicker endometrium in the progesterone phase of the HRT. Features of endometrial cancer are an increased thickness, i.e. more than 3 or 5 mm in postmenopausal women using that sign guideline 61, irregular margins, increased and variable echogenicity, the tumour can be polypoidal and it may extend into the cervical canal. Look for fluid in the uterine cavity. This can be suspicious if it's echogenic. But you can see the endometrium more clearly. It's outlined by the fluid. And as Professor Goldstein says, look at the doughnut, not at the hole. But ultrasound cannot reliably distinguish between benign polyps, endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. So be careful. When looking at the cervix, you always examine the endocervix carefully during the scan, but you cannot see ectocervical lesions well, so always write at the end of your report that cervical pathology cannot be excluded on ultrasound and suggest a speculum examination. Here are some examples of pathology seen in women with postmenopausal bleeding. This is a retroverted uterus, so here's the cervical canal going into the endometrial cavity. This is cervix, anterior wall, now anterior wall of uterus going up to fundus, posterior wall of uterus and back to cervix again. And here is the cervical canal with a little bit of mucus. And here you can clearly see a little polyp in the cervical canal with a nice feeder vessel. So this is an endometrial polyp. This is an antiverted uterus, again longitudinal planes, anterior cervix, anterior uterus, uterine fundus, posterior wall, back to the cervix, cervical canal going into the endometrial cavity and here you can see lovely thin endometrium outlined by some fluid in the cavity and the way to measure the endometrial thickness here is to go outer to outer and inner to inner. This will give you the most, um, the, the best measurement. This can be completely normal and caused sometimes by a little bit of internal osteonosis in postmenopausal women. Do be careful to do a systematic scan from cornea to cornea to make sure there's not a little bit of abnormal endometrium just off to the side there. Here again is a longitudinal view of an antiverted uterus, so the bladder is there. Here is the endometrial cavity and you can see here an endometrial polyp. This is a transverse view of a little endometrial polyp in the endometrial cavity patient's right is on this side, the patient's left is here, with again a little feeder vessel into the polyp. Not all polyps have a feeder vessel. And this is a 3D image. This is the uterine fundus, the patient's right side, the patient's left side, and this is a coronal view. You can see a nice triangular endometrial cavity, and here you can see an endometrial polyp. This again is a retroverted uterus, so this is the cavity of the uterus. The cervix is here, the uterine fundus is here, and here you can see a fibroid polyp in the endometrial cavity, outlined by a little bit of fluid. This is an axial uterus. In postmenopausal women, the uterus is often axial, and the cervix looked normal, but when we put colour on, we could see a feeder vessel which went to a polyp which had prolapsed into the vagina. So you're not going to be able to see that polyp, but you'll see the feeder vessel to it. Here again is an antiverted uterus. And you can see this is the cavity here. It's, the echogenicity of this is very similar to myometrium. This is a bit of blood in the cavity, a hematometra. And on color, you can see that the vascularity is only in the myometrium and of course there wouldn't be any in the hematometra itself. And this is a pyometra, this is again a longitudinal view, you can just see the cavity, cavity here 
and you can see the contents of the cavity are of low level but varied echogenicity, uh, typical of pus. It can be very difficult to tell a hematometra and a palmetra apart. Again, if there had been colour in the centre, that would suggest uh, solid tissue, whereas there's no colour, this is pus. This is an antiverted uterus, anterior wall, fundus, posterior wall and cervix, cervical canal coming into the endometrial cavity. And at first view, you can see that the endometrial thickness is increased. Um, this looks like solid tissue, but we would need uh, colour to be sure. But beyond that, you can't see very much. Whereas, when you go in the transverse view, you can again see the endometrial cavity with some solid material in the cavity. But look at this area here. And this is invasion from a malignancy. So an endometrial cancer which is invading the myometrium. And that's quite clear in that image. So always be sure to look at your cavity in the longitudinal and the transverse planes. The vascularity of these tumours tends to be uh, irregular and marked. So here you can see a polypoidal lesion almost filling the endometrial cavity. And you can see that it's got very abnormal vascularity. I often start with a PRF of 0.6 and be sure to adjust the gain to get the right sensitivity. This is more difficult. This is now a retroverted uterus. This is the endometrial cavity. This is the cervix. This is the uterine fundus. So bladder is up there. It's a longitudinal view, cervical canal, endometrial cavity. You can see here that it's very difficult to know what is the endometrial thickness. Is it from here to here? Or is it in fact just that? And the reason for that is that there is subendometrial cystic change. And in fact, the cavity itself was very, very thin and atrophic. And this was purely um, subendometrial cystic change caused by tamoxifen. Tamoxifen can also cause polyps. And this again is an antiverted uterus. Here is the endometrial cavity, you can see. And there are two large endometrial polyps with quite strong vascularity. These were benign. Cervical cancer is something that you can see on ultrasound in women with postmenopausal bleeding. A longitudinal view again. Here is the bladder. This is the region of the cervix. And you can see this, this low-level echogenicity, a solid lesion which expands the cervix and the vascularity is grossly abnormal. This was a confirmed cervical cancer. Sometimes it's not so easy. Again, this is a longitudinal view of an antiverted uterus. Here is the bladder. This is the area of the cervix. Here you can see the endometrium. And this is the anterior wall of the uterus, fundus and posterior wall. And you can see that this clearly looks to be a cervical cancer rather than an endometrial cancer, but the pathology was uncertain. It was impossible to say whether this was a cervical cancer invading the endometrial cavity or an endometrial cancer invading the cervix, but on ultrasound it looks very much like a cervical primary. Post-hysterectomy, women with postmenopausal bleeding, you should still scan them because this is what you might find at the vault. This was a large, irregular, solid mass with variable echogenicity, some irregular cystic spaces. It's irregular because the external outline is irregular as well as the internal cystic spaces and it's got very strong and irregular vascularity. So on IOTA rules this is an irregular solid mass with strong vascularity and this is a malignancy. This was an ovarian cancer at the vaginal vault. Always look at the bladder in women with postmenopausal bleeding. The urethra will be uh, going this way. And this is the anterior bladder wall. This is the posterior wall coming back via the trigone. And you can see here uh, a clear bladder polyp. And always look in the pouch of Douglas. Here is what's left of the cervix and the uterus going off in this direction. And you can see an irregular solid mass in the pouch of Douglas with strong vascularity and this was bowel cancer. So in conclusion, postmenopausal bleeding is common. In primary care, there are certain features that warrant urgent referral to gynaecology, like an abnormal speculum or a pelvic examination, or patients with postmenopausal bleeding on tamoxifen. 
In secondary care, we take a history, perform a pelvic ultrasound, a speculum examination, and then possibly also a hysteroscopy and or endometrial biopsy. Ultrasound is very useful in the management of postmenopausal bleeding, and it's possible to diagnose various pelvic malignancies. At least a third of women with postmenopausal bleeding do not need a hysteroscopy using um, sign guidelines, and you can set up a one-stop clinic. Thank you.